Hi folks, and welcome to Philosophy According to Eddie. And today we're going to be looking at the final aspect of ethics, which is sexual ethics. So, uh, we are obviously going to be looking at a mm, somewhat sensitive subject. One that is taboo in many cultures, but it's an important one to consider, particularly when we're considering Christian teaching, because there is actually a lot of varied teaching around sex and sexuality in, Christian in Christianity. It's a thorny issue. It's caused a lot of problems because the ideas of sex and of different forms of sexuality really draw out key tensions in Christianity and in the Bible. The Bible has been read, interpreted, reinterpreted many times. Not to mention the fact that there is an Old and a New Testament, both of which are important. Some elements of the New and Old Testament uh, either contradict or at least grate against each other. There's the conservative and the liberal approach. There's the conservative Christians who want to keep it the way it has been traditionally versus the liberal Christians who want to reinterpret for the modern era. There are various denominations. We're going to particularly be focusing on Roman Catholicism and on uh, the Church of England. But there's also Baptist, Methodist, Quaker, Orthodox. There's all kinds that go on, all of which have subtly different approaches towards sex and sexuality. But it's not much easier in secular society, in non-religious society either, because there are cultural differences about sex and about sexuality. There are also uh, international and national laws that are different. Some countries, uh, certainly the, make, the making of this video, um, some countries still outlaw homosexuality outright. Others have legalised it. Others have legalised gay marriage. So all of these show differences in the ideas of uh, sex and sexuality uh, within both society and within Christianity. So we're going to be looking at uh, the ideas of sex within marriage, before marriage and outside marriage, as well as the idea of homosexuality um, and by extension bisexuality and various other forms of sexuality that sit on that spectrum. But we're particularly going to focus on homosexuality because that's the one that the church um, in particular focuses on. Sex within marriage means you're married when you have sex. Sex before marriage, premarital sex, is um, when you are a couple but not married. Outside marriage means adultery, essentially. Sex outside marriage means you are married um, or have been married, um, possibly, and that you're having sex with someone else. Those are, those are the main conceptions, those four conceptions. And we're going to be looking at the traditional Christian approaches, natural law approaches, so thinking about Aquinas, situation ethics with Joseph Fletcher, Kantian ethics with, surprise, surprise, Kant, and utilitarianism, particularly male, but we will look at Bentham briefly as well. We'll also be considering the ideas of Jeremy Taylor, Alan Wilson, Michel Foucault, and W. Norman Bittinger. Overall, the traditional Christian approach is that sex should be within marriage in order to create children. That's what it can be boiled down to. Essentially, sex is procreative. And this kind of follows the idea of natural law, the idea that we should be um, creating children, and that is following God's will. So marital sex, in general, is considered to be, yep, good, and you should be creating children while you're at it. It's a union of man and woman, because that's how you create children, and that is symbolic. It is symbolic of the relationship of God with the world. It's this idea of, sort of nurturing um, and uh, procreating, but also controlling sex into something that is, um, is not going to lead to immoral behaviour. It's kept moral, it's kept correct. And that's all based on natural law. So the three goods of marriage are considered to be procreation, nurture and control of sex. Basically, if you're married, it helps to achieve those three ideas. You can procreate, you can nurture children, and you can control sexual urges. All good as far as traditional Christianity is concerned. 
However, there are two different approaches towards what marriage actually is. For Roman Catholics, and particularly more traditional Christians, it's the idea of a sacrament. Getting married is, in fact, in itself a form of religious and holy thing. Um, it's essentially showing um, your willingness to God beyond simply doing the right thing for your partner. You are committing yourself to God within the relationship as well. Um, Mark 10, uh, 2-12 backs this up. Check out that passage. More... Uh, liberal and more Protestant Christians tend to go with the idea of the covenant rather than this being sort of an act of worship in itself and like a, a holy act what you're doing is you're making a covenant uh, i.e. an agreement um, in the, the uh, with, with your uh, wife or husband to be you're making that commitment to them you're making that covenant you're making the agreement and you're doing it in the eyes of God so almost like God is there to oversee it and say, yep, I've witnessed that you've done this. You're not sort of connecting in this holy act in the same way. It's more that what you're doing is approved by God and you're doing it to show that you're willing to be a part of it. So that's the traditional approach and particularly in the Christian marriage service, um, you get a lot of that feeling. And the whole point of that marriage is therefore to say, yep, um, you are now bonded, you can now um, consummate the marriage, i.e. you can have sex, because those three goods of marriage um, need to be fulfilled. You need to procreate, you need to nurture children, and you need to control your sexual urges. However, there is another approach to this as well, and that is one from uh, Jeremy Taylor, which actually came about quite early, 17th century. And he suggested that marriage can also be a compassionate thing. Essentially, well, he suggested any friendship, any relationship that you create with any person is a form of marriage. You are committing to that other person. And so therefore, on the, if all of our friendships can be marriages, why can't our marriage be a friendship? It doesn't have to be all about sexuality. And it doesn't have to be all about raising children. So... The suggestion here is that you can potentially have a, a marriage that doesn't have a sexual element to it. Um, this is not the orthodox church teaching. Um, most church teaching suggests that you should actually um, consummate the marriage. You should have sex once you've got married in order to complete it, if you like. However, this idea of the compassionate marriage is also very important because that's um, a, an element that suggests that you could use contraception within marriage. Because you're looking at it from a more friendship point of view, not necessarily a sexual point of view, and therefore you don't need to procreate, you don't need to nurture children. So you could therefore go ahead, use contraception, not have children, but still have a sexual marriage. Premarital sex is generally frowned upon and forbidden by traditional church teaching. Sex should be for the consummation of the marriage, as we've seen there, and therefore, flipping it over, you shouldn't be having sex if you're not married. And this is backed up by 1 Corinthians 7 to 9, um, which suggests, yep, yeah, you shouldn't be having sex unless you're married. Now, that traditionally led to the view that cohabitation, as in living together, um, in a relationship, is living in sin. That's a very Augustinian approach, isn't it? Original sin, all that kind of idea. Basically, if you're not married uh, and you're living together, the assumption is, therefore, you must be having sex as well, and therefore, you are living in sin. It's a bit old-fashioned. Modern Christianity tends to be more pragmatic you may not want to get married straight away. You may want to live together to make sure that you are compatible with each other. Don't forget, marriage is supposed to be an institution for life here. It's a full-on commitment, so surely you want to live together first, make sure you're compatible. That may include a sexual relationship, and most modern, particularly Protestant churches, will accept that, yeah, this is fair. 
if you're trying it out for marriage, as in if you really are thinking, yeah, we could get married here, but we need to make sure. So it's about the intent. Are you intending to do the right thing? It's not just about the consequences, which is living together and having sex. So marriage, therefore, is an ideal. That's what you should be aiming for. And if that's what you're aiming for, great. Um, but yeah, you can cohabit in the, in the meantime, but just uh, don't go too far. However, extramarital sex, so this counts as adultery, prostitution. These are considered to be absolute no-go. Intolerable. That's how it's described. Because it's very damaging to the natural order of things i.e. these goods of marriage, procreation, nurture and control of sex, all of those go out the window if you're having sex with someone else while you're married or if you're using prostitutes. So overall, no, don't do it at all. And Leviticus 10.20 suggests that anyone who commits any form of adultery should be uh, executed. However, Leviticus is Old Testament, so if it's Old Testament, anything that comes in the New Testament generally supersedes it. Um, in fact, that's what Paul himself said. St. Paul said that um, if Jesus taught, essentially said, if Jesus taught it and there's a contradiction, then go with what Jesus said, not with the Old Testament. So Jesus suggested we should actually forgive the, uh, the adulterers. And generally women were looked on as sort of the temptresses, again very Augustinian. Women are the ones who do the tempting, women should be punished more. And in John 8, 7 to 11, Jesus um, essentially confronts a crowd who are going to execute a woman uh, by stoning for committing adultery. And that's where he says the famous line, let him without sin cast the first stone. As in, if you've never done anything wrong in your life, you go ahead and throw stones to execute her. But of course no one did, because everyone's committed sins in some way, and so nobody threw a stone. The whole point being, we should forgive. And Jesus did say, yep, you shall be forgiven, but don't sin anymore. Learn from it, move on. It was wrong, but you are forgiven. The traditional Catholic approach um, however, sort of almost rubs up against this suggestion um, because it, um, it looks quite harshly on any form of adultery um, and in a sense is very unforgiving because it suggests that if you're divorced, if you're married and you divorce, any future relationship becomes adultery. So it's quite unforgiving in that sense. The idea being that marriage is one man, one woman, um, and that you've made that sacrament, remember? That holy union. So if you break yourselves apart, uh, you're firstly not allowed to divorce, but if you do, you've broken your union with God. Bad news. That's not the case in a lot of Protestantism. Um, most Protestant approaches will say, yes, you can divorce if you've got very good reason to. Um, but generally divorce is not looked on very well in traditional Christianity. Uh, and that goes back to um, Mark 10. Homosexuality is a particularly tricky issue because the church gets a lot of very bad press about how it handles homosexuality. And the general belief is that Christians believe homosexuality is wrong, it's immoral, and that it should essentially be punished. There's an element of that, but it's more subtle than that, so let's unpack it a little bit. Basically, sex is supposed to be unitative, so unitive, even, and procreative. So it should be, again, remember, goods of marriage, procreation, nurturing children, control of sexual desire. Now, you can't do that if you're homosexual. It's, uh, well, not in yourselves. I mean, you could have, you could adopt, you could have surrogate children, but um, traditionally that wasn't available um, from a technological perspective. So it's a tricky one. Generally, Christianity suggests that homosexuality um, 
should not lead to sex. And there's varying degrees of that. So chastity, you know, living a celibate, unsexual life, never having sex, is the way that should be encouraged in traditional Christianity. Because homosexuality is considered to be wrong, according to certain translations. So it's Genesis 19, 1 to 8, that's Sodom and Gomorrah, where uh, the two cities um, in which uh, there was all kinds of homosexual activity going on, such as sodomy, which is where it comes from, Sodom, sodomy, um, it was going on, and it was punished by God for being immoral. Leviticus 18-22, suggesting that um, homosexuality goes against the natural order of things. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11, in which um, the act of homosexuality is denounced, essentially, um, as being um, an improper thing to be doing. And Romans 1, 18 to 32, which suggests, um, again, that homosexuality is, uh, is wrong and that it goes against the natural order of things. Now, these two are Old Testament, these two are New Testament. That's the traditional interpretation. However, liberal Christianity, modern Christianity, has reinterpreted these, these Bible phrases because they believe there have been some mistranslations and misunderstandings. Genesis 19.1-8 suggests Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, things going on such as uh, sodomy, so gay sex. They're not the only things that are going on here. Sodom, is, Sodom and Gomorrah are basically immoral towns. There's all kinds of immorality going on. The problem you could uh, suggest, actually, is not... The, uh, the act of homosexual sex, it's the way in which it's being done. These people aren't married. It's premarital sex. It's forbidden anyway. So, in a sense, it's not the man and man or woman and woman thing. It's the fact that it's not within marriage, that it's lustful. That's where the problem is. Leviticus 18.22. Well, there's two issues here. Number one, suggesting that um, it goes against the natural order of things. Mm, well, arguably, yes, that that is what Leviticus suggests. But firstly, there are translation issues. The suggestion that man shall not lie with man. Actually, if you go back to the original Greek, it's more likely to be translated as man shall not lie with boy. So, men shall not have sex with boys. Now that changes things entirely, doesn't it? When you think about it, that's essentially saying that you can't be a paedophile, not that you can't be gay. Also, Leviticus, it's Old Testament, so anything that Jesus suggested overrules it. So let's have a look at Corinthians and Romans. <clears throat> Corinthians, um, this is where Paul is suggesting that um, Homosexual sex is um, not Jewish, it is not Christian, it shouldn't be accepted. Well, possibly. But again, the suggestion is that it's the act of sex um, in a sort of premarital sense that's the issue. And he's using it really as sort of a comparison to what the Romans are doing. Uh, and he's saying, this isn't the right way to be. You shouldn't act like this, you should act like us. He's drawing opposites. He's saying the Romans are immoral, they're having homosexual sex. But it's the lustful idea. Again, you could argue that it's the lustful idea and not the, um, uh, not the homosexuality in itself. Romans 1, 18-32, it's a similar story. Um, and both of them really suggest that, yeah, if Jesus has said it's okay then you can accept it over the Old Testament. In fact, that's mentioned in, uh, I believe it's Romans. So overall, reinterpretation of these verses suggests actually maybe homosexuality isn't the problem. Maybe it's the lustful sex, whether it's 
homosexual or heterosexual. And that's why appropriate homosexual relationships have come to be accepted in more liberal Protestant Christianity. The idea that actually Jesus suggested that the most important thing is love, love thy neighbour as thyself. So if you've got two loving people who, yeah, the same sex, but if they're loving, committed to each other, they want to marry, why not let them? Again, they can have a marriage in a sort of a compassionate sense, like Taylor suggested. So, all things considered, modern Christianity suggests, yes, this is more acceptable. However, there has to be a degree of um, acceptance of commitment. Um, and again, you then have, it brings up the issue of surrogate children. If, say, a, uh, if an, a third partner was included in order to uh, produce children, is that acceptable? It's something that's very divided at the moment. So overall, the issues that come up are ones of biblical uh, contradiction, ambiguity and translation. How do you understand what the Bible says? Whose approach are you following? Michel Foucault, French sociologist, also suggested that a lot of these traditional ideas of sex um, within marriage are all about control rather than about um, truly being Christian. So it's about controlling people, making sure that they, um, essentially they follow these rules uh, for their faith because that way the church can put pressure on them. Which is a sort of, uh, well it's something that needs to be considered. Natural law is generally aligned with the traditional Christian approach, however there are some variations, so we will investigate what they are. Generally the feeling is that marital sex is the best form of sex within natural law. Divine law is that humans should pair off and procreate, again this is Augustinian as well, and that marriage orders society. It's a primary precept to order society and marriage providing those goods of procreation, nurturing and control of, uh, of sexuality. Basically is a, a perfect example of the ordering of society. And also you've made your sacrament to God, uh, so with God even, and therefore marriage is A-OK -okay, and that's the way we should be going. And that's fulfilled by uh, Genesis 1. 28, which suggests people should go forth and multiply. And this is also um, the suggestion as to why we shouldn't use artificial contraception, because it's going against the idea of procreating. Premarital sex, therefore, traditionally is frowned upon um, as an apparent good rather than an actual good, so it seems to be the right thing to do, uh, but actually it's not, it just seems to be, but really what we ought to be doing is waiting until marriage. However, liberals following the natural law approach could also say that it's acceptable if it's fulfilling the primary precepts. So if it is ordering society, showing uh, respect to God, um, even if it's for procreation as well, but for the right reasons, it could be acceptable. Extramarital sex, however, completely unacceptable. This goes against divine law, it goes against natural law, just no. Homosexuality. Traditionally is opposed, but modern natural law theologians are more accepting of it. So, the traditional feeling is that, yep, you need to procreate, or at least be able to procreate in theory, uh, when you're having sex and therefore homosexuality can't and must therefore not fulfill the precepts. However, theologians such as Pittinger, uh, W. Norman Pittinger, suggest this is overly biological um, if you're condemning homosexuals for not being able to have children. There are childless couples um, who, no matter how hard they try, can't have children. Should they stop having sex because they can't have children? It, 
it doesn't seem to seem to fit so therefore surely we should allow a loving homosexual relationship if it's loving if it's showing commitment then um, that is providing uh, primary precepts in a different way ordering society by showing an example of love uh, which of course Jesus taught um, and you can worship God as well in that by showing love and commitment to a single other person um, Thomas Aquinas as well, when he talked about homosexuality, um, was really, when he was talking about homosexual acts, he wasn't just talking about homosexual acts. It seems to be forgotten that really what he was talking about was any kind of um, lustful sexual act, um, including masturbation, extramarital sex. So it didn't, the homosexuality bit is almost a, uh, a red herring here. It's not about man and man, woman and woman, it's about love, according to the more liberal Christians. Of course, all of this then runs up against the issue that Michel Foucault came up with, which is that uh, maybe all of this is about normative behaviour. Maybe it's about the fact that we normalise uh, one man, one woman in a marital relationship and everything else feels wrong because society says it's wrong and because we don't expect it, it's not normal. Um, but actually there's nothing wrong with it at all. And that all of this is a complete um, misunderstanding. It's saying that this is against the natural way of things, but actually there is no natural way of things. There's only a normal way of things, which is quite a significant criticism of natural law. If all of natural law is essentially um, what we're used to rather than something that's divinely provided, then the whole idea of an innate natural law falls apart. Situation ethics, as you would expect, takes quite a different approach to natural law. It's focused primarily on personal autonomy and love. So it's about you making your own decisions for the most loving thing. So therefore it is permissive. It allows anything that you think is going to create the most love and there are no absolutes. Which leads us to a relatively straightforward set of conclusions, in fairness. Firstly, marital sex. Well, the ideas of love and autonomy, so doing the loving thing and doing things that you decide yourself, that supports the idea of marriage. If you want to marry, you go ahead. Why not? It's a good thing to do, it's a loving thing to do if you choose it. If it's chosen for you, if it's an arranged marriage, or if you're forced into it, that's not loving, that's not acceptable. And in fairness, that goes with natural law as well. If you're forced into marriage, that's not acceptable. But marriage is not necessary when it comes to sexual relationships. It's, it's good, but you don't have to be married. Um, life companionship is uh, also perfectly acceptable. You may not want to get married for personal reasons, uh, you may not believe in the idea of marriage, but you want to commit to someone. That's fine. It's the most loving thing to do. Jesus would be happy with it, according to situation ethics. Premarital sex is fine if it's loving and respectful. So if you love each other, you respect each other, all good. Go ahead. As long as you're not um, treating someone in an unloving way. The exploration of sex, of sexuality and of relationships is a healthy thing, if done appropriately. Uh, and it supports the idea of autonomy and of love. Extramarital sex could be justified under certain circumstances. So, for example, if talking about, say, spies in the war who uh, would have sex with the enemy in order to blackmail them or to get information. Maybe it's acceptable, but generally it's not, because it's not loving um, and it causes unhappiness. So overall, not a good thing. Homosexuality, we focus on the Bible more as indicative. It's an indicator as to what to do, not a prescriptive approach. It's not prescribing this is what you must do. Remember, no absolutes. So we follow the... Uh, the, the, um, the instinct of the Bible. We're following the principle of the Bible, not the word. Which actually, if you think about natural law, we should be following the, uh, the yus rather than the lex, which is the same idea. So, 
The Bible is an indicator, it's not prescriptive, and therefore, as long as it's a loving and respectful relationship, there's nothing wrong with homosexuality. Biblical context must be considered. Um, a lot of the time, um, when homosexuality was mentioned, it was trying to oppose the Romans or the pagans, who were uh, considered to be immoral, against the Christians and the Jews, who were considered to be moral. And so they were trying to draw opposite comparisons. It doesn't mean necessarily that they were really anti-homosexuality. It's more that they were trying to say, here is the bad, here is the good, this is the one you should accept. And homosexuality kind of got used as an example. That's the feeling of situation ethics anyway. So, overall, there are no absolutes. You should do what you think is the most loving and generally that allows a lot of liberalism. However, the extramarital sex is generally considered to be a bad idea. Kantian ethics focuses on the categorical imperative, which is you should always act as if you're making rules for the whole of society, you shouldn't treat people as a means to an end, and you should act as if you are a lawmaker for society as well. So, from that, we get that marital sex is uh, considered to be a good thing as long as it's based on the right reasons and the right approaches. It's all about promises and duties. Promises to commit to each other and a duty to commit to each other when those promises have been made. But we need to look a little bit more carefully at the idea of duty. What is the nature of the duty, particularly around sex? Sex merely out of duty isn't acceptable. If you're married and you feel that you have to have sex because, well, that's your marital duty, that's not okay. Because essentially you are uh, treating yourself as a means to the other person's end. Or if you encourage your partner to have sex with you and they do so out of duty, you're treating them as a means to an end. So it's not acceptable. It goes against the second form of the categorical imperative. So sex needs to be free equal and consensual, freely chosen, equal amounts of respect and consent on both parties. Also, marriage is seen as compassionate, according to Kant, so it is about friendships and it's about committing to each other in that sense, it's not merely about sex. If it were merely about sex, at the point at which um, procreation is no longer possible, then there'd be no reason for the people to be married anymore and so you would have made an illogical decision. Remember, Kant is all about logic. Premarital sex risks using others as a means to an end, so you have to be careful with it, but there's no initial problem, no inherent problem with um, having a, uh, a premarital uh, sexual cohabitation. Procreation is important, so you should still have children um, if you're in a loving relationship, uh, but that means you could substitute cohabitation with marriage if people committed in the same way. If they acted in the same way as marriage but didn't marry, that's acceptable. Extramarital sex is considered to be wrong. It's unequal, it lacks respect, it treats people as a means to an end, so overall not acceptable, particularly in the case of prostitution. Now, homosexuality is a bit tricky. And this is where there's an issue. Kant himself was opposed to homosexuality. He suggested that homosexuality was demeaning, it demeaned uh, man to below the level of beasts, um, and that it shows a lack of commitment, and therefore goes against the categorical imperative. But this doesn't seem to work. Um, in a more modern sense, a Kantian, rather than Kant himself, would think, well, surely, based on all of these, as long as it is a free, equal and consensual relationship, and sex is free, equal and consensual, if you commit to each other, make promises, uphold those duties, surely a homosexual relationship isn't a problem. Uh, as long as you're doing everything else right, in terms of the relationship, it doesn't matter the sex or gender of those who are in the relationship. So that is a bit of a problem, Kant versus the Kantian. So a modern Kantian wouldn't have a problem with it, there's no inherent issue, it depends on the relationship, not on uh, the sexuality involved, but Kant himself was opposed, probably due to uh, feelings towards homosexuality at the time, more of a normative thing, thinking back to Foucault, 
rather than an actual ethical thing. The utilitarian approach is a secular approach, so it takes God out of the equation altogether, the first out of our series of theories. And it goes to the ideas of liberty and the greatest good to the greatest number. So really all relationships are based on that calculation. What's good for people? What's good for society? Are you free to do whatever you like, as long as you're not harming anyone else? So for both marital and premarital sex, it depends on the quality of your relationship. If you've got a good relationship and if sex is going to benefit it, then yeah, go for it. Uh, preference and rule utilitarians suggest that a marriage should be based on shared values. And so as long as um, each person is being respected, their freedoms are being allowed and they're not harming anyone else, go for it. Same with uh, premarital sex. There's no inherent difference to marriage as far as utilitarians can see. They really don't mind. Extramarital sex, however, is um, more complicated. It's not inherently wrong. There's nothing uh, absolutely wrong about it. Um, however, there is a greater risk of harm if you are committing adultery, using prostitutes, that sort of thing, uh, because you are likely to cause mistrust, jealousy, even an open marriage. Um, and also, you've got to think about the risk of um, sexually transmitted infections that come with um, a, if multiple sexual partners and the harm that could do to society. Homosexuality follows on from that, really, in that there's no inherent right to a sexual relationship in the same way that there isn't in any of these. There are no natural rights afforded by utilitarians. But people are free to their own sexuality um, as long as it is according to the harm principle. If they're not harming anyone else, they're free to do what they like. So, therefore, no problem with homosexuality per se. Moral offence, so people being offended or concerned about the morality of homosexuality, moral panic around it, is irrelevant, according to Mill. It's not an acceptable opposition to uh, people's liberty, because moral offence is not based on anything other than prejudice, which Michel Foucault backs up. Of course, an act utilitarian, however, would consider moral offence, because it's if it's the greater public opinion, if more people are being offended, if everyone's being offended, and there's only a small number who are um, homosexual, then, according to the hedonic calculus, you shouldn't allow them to be homosexual. They haven't got an inherent right to their relationship. But rule and preference utilitarians would say, no, ignore it. Um, ignore any moral offence. It's not a good defence. Issues that come from this are the variety in society that comes with people doing what they like just because um, uh, they're not harming anyone else is not necessarily a positive thing. Um, a society often works better if people are united behind principles. So if everyone's just doing their own thing, it might actually be bad for society. And also there's the question of the private and the public. You do what you like as long as you're not harming anyone else in your private home, but surely that's going to affect how you treat other people when you get out um, into the real world, um, particularly when thinking about things like pornography usage. Um, if you think about um, particularly young people viewing pornography and thinking that's how sexual relationships work, it could do harm at a greater societal level. So therefore, it's not as straightforward as the utilitarian may suggest. So, in the video today, we have looked at various approaches towards sexual ethics. We've looked at traditional Christian approaches, um, then a variety of Christian approaches through natural law, situation ethics and Kantian ethics, to the secular approach of utilitarianism. We've looked at the problems that surround marital and premarital sex, extramarital sex and homosexual sexual relationships. We've covered a lot of information, all of it quite delicate, but hopefully this has helped to clarify some issues. So, if you have any questions let me know. Thanks for watching. See you next time.